What's going on reverse engineers? Have you ever bought a product like an IP camera or a router or some other product and you wanted to understand the inner workings of the software but you didn't know how? Well in this video I'm going to show you how to do that. Firmware is going to be software that's installed directly into the device, into read-only memory, and it's designed specifically to work with that particular hardware on that device. The firmware can usually be updated, and that's going to be done in one of two ways, usually wirelessly. If it actually hooks up to the internet, sometimes it can update itself. The other way is the actual vendor will give you new firmware, which you can use to install into it using some administrative panel. In this video, we're going to take advantage of that second method because the second method means the vendor is going to offer the firmware directly to us. That means we can download it and then we can examine it. If the firmware is not available from their website, you can still get it. It just typically involves actually popping the case open of the piece of hardware and then using something like a UART cable to download the firmware. And I'll probably cover that in a separate video. So let's go ahead and jump in. So in this video, we're going to look at the Netgear WNR2000 as the firmware that we're going to examine. So if you're somebody who's thinking to themselves right now, don't only hackers do this, then it's probably worth mentioning that there's lots of legitimate reasons why you might want to reverse engineer something like this. Three primary things come to mind. The first is just general curiosity. The second is going to be if you are making software or hardware that's designed to interoperate with this hardware and there's no published way to understand the internals of what you're trying to interoperate with. And then the third is if you're some sort of security researcher and you need to actually do a security audit on a piece of hardware to make sure everything is safe and secure and there's nothing malicious about it. So in this video, we're doing it purely out of general curiosity, but you can decide what you wanna do it with when you try this out. So the first step is to download the firmware. I've already done that. If you still need to do that, you can go to a manufacturer's website and grab the firmware there if they offer it. In this case, they've given it to me as a zip file, so a simple unzip command should do the trick here. What this leaves me with is one IMG file and one zip file. Of course, we don't need the zip file anymore, so we can discard that now. So we have our IMG file, and the first thing I understand is this is going to be a binary file, which means if we open it with something like less, we see that it is all just, we can't read this. This is not something we can do anything with. So we're going to need to enlist some tools to make sense of this. The first tool we're going to use is something called binwalk, and to use it, we do binwalk, and then we specify the file name, and we hit enter. Binwalk is a really cool program because it analyzes binary files and looks for specific byte sequences to try to determine what types of things are at different regions of this binary. So what Binwalk has told us so far is that there's some Lisma compressed data starting at byte 128, and then there's a SquashFS file system starting at byte 950,016. Now keep in mind, binwalk's not perfect. It does give false positives, and sometimes it gives us bad data. Like for instance, it says dictionary size is 8.3 megabytes, but our firmware is only 3.6 megabytes. So of course that's not accurate. The other thing it says is our uncompressed size is 3.2 meg and our compressed size is 3.6 meg. That's also suspicious. Why would an uncompressed version be less than a compressed version? However, the SquashFS file system one seems a little more accurate. It's saying it's about 2.6 meg and it starts at the one meg point. 2.6 meg plus one meg is 3.6 meg, which is about the size of our firmware. So this is probably accurate. Binwalk has a really cool feature. We can visualize the information entropy of a given binary. And we can do this by running the same command, but with a dash capital E. And what this will do is it'll open up a chart that looks like this. I know it's very small and I apologize I can't make it bigger, but the left side of this chart is a range of zero to one. And in information entropy, things that are obfuscated or compressed are often a one. Now because this line is basically a one all the way across with the exception of this very small portion that sharply drop off, this basically means that 99.9% .9 of this file is compressed and or obfuscated and it has a little tiny bit at the end that's unobfuscated, but we won't worry about that right now. So let's go back to our results of our binwalk command. This squashfs file system, this is of particular interest to me. And the reason this is of interest is because squashfs is a read-only compressed Linux file system, meaning that this probably contains a directory tree for Linux. What we need to do now is we need to separate this segment of the binary out. That way we can uncompress it and get that directory structure. And the tool we're gonna to use to that is something called dd, and that's gonna allow us to carve out this portion of the binary. So the way dd works is you start by specifying an input file. In this case, we're going to do if equals and then the name of this binary. Now we know the squashfs file system starts at byte 950,016. So with dd, what we can do is we can say skip the first 950,016 bytes. So now we got to specify an output file. So we do of equals and then we'll just call it Linux because we're pretty sure that it's going to be a Linux file tree. 
And the last thing we'll do is specify a block size of one, and then we'll hit enter and let it do its thing. It took about five seconds, but now we have a new file called Linux. Now there's a couple ways to look at the underlying file system. We could either mount it to a folder or we could just extract it. So to extract it, we can do unsquashfs and then specify the file name and hit enter. We see now that we have a new folder called squashfs-root. If we cd into that folder, we see that we have a Linux file tree. Now, of course, there's going to be tons of goodies in here and tons of things you're going to want to look at, but we can get a quick kind of list of files by doing find dot and then pipe it to less. And then we can actually look at all the files that are in here. So we have some stuff in Etsy. We have some stuff in user www.html. We see that the majority of the stuff is there. We have lots of HTML files, lots of JavaScript files. So we know that this is probably the web interface for this particular router. Of course, examining specific files is out of the scope of this video just because all firmwares are different and it's going to be based on what you're trying to attain or learn about. So this is only half of it. We still have that Lizma compressed archive that we need to go look at. So let's go ahead and check that out. So getting that second segment was easy because we just had to read from byte 950,016 all the way to the end. With the Lizma compressed data, it's a little harder because all it says is that I see something that is probably the Lizma compressed data starting at 128, but it doesn't give a definitive length. All we know is that it could go to up to that 950,016th byte. So again, we're going to use a dd command, and we'll start with the previous command, except here we're going to have to do a little math. We're going to have to say we're going to start at 128. You know, that's not a problem. We can skip to 128. That's the easy part. But now we have to introduce a new option here called count. And the count is going to be how many bytes we want to read. We don't want to read to the end. So what we have to read to is 950,016 minus the 128. So we need to read 949,888 bytes. Now this should read everything up to the start of the SquashFS file system. And then for the output file, we'll call it something.lzma. Hit enter and let it do its thing. So if we do an ls, we can see that we have our something.lizma file. Now, now earlier I said we know where the compressed data starts, but we don't know where it ends. The good thing is that we can use lzma-d to decompress it. And by redirecting that file in and then outputting it as another file, what it will cause it to do is actually discard any trailing garbage. So when we run this, it's going to say compressed data is corrupt, but that's okay. We still have our file called something, which is going to be what it could read. So next thing we should do is we should again run bin walk, but on this, but this time we're going to run it on something. So this is what bin walk thinks is in here. We got some certificates. We have something that thinks is the Linux kernel, HTML document header and footer, and some Unix paths. Now it does not show the presence of any additional compressed data. And I want to show you the information entropy command again. If we do bin walk dash capital E on this one, we see we get a graph that's significantly different. The typical threshold for possible obfuscate or compressed data is a 0.7. And the 0.7 here, and I'm sorry again that it's small, but it rides pretty much right on the top of this middle pattern here. What we can take away from this is that the majority of what's left is all uncompressed. At this point, you can examine what's left here, and if there's anything of any interest, you can extract it in the same way as you did the other stuff. And that's kind of all there is to it. Keep in mind that this is definitely a light introduction. You can, of course, encounter numerous things that were not covered in this video. But the best way to learn more about it is to experiment and get some firmware and try it out for yourself and see what you can uncover. As always, if you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video, go ahead and leave them below in the comments. Other than that, I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.